Welcome to Dust Geek. Boy, AI is exciting, isn't it? Don't you enjoy the rising costs of your electricity bill every month? Don't you enjoy the fact that the hardware like RAM now is double in price? So all these big corporations can zap up all of your information and use it to replace you at work. Well, that's the plan and well, it's going. But today we're going to focus specifically on Google because Google, they, uh, they're special. They're special. And they ruled out their new Gemini AI. Uh, very exciting news for all of us in the privacy and security world. Uh, rolled out this new Gemini AI to every Gmail and Google Workspace user as of January 2025. And what this does, apparently, is it reads your emails, your chats, your meeting calls, your documents, your drive files, even business plans have it on by default. Now, people are, certain people, are furious over this, and there are lawsuits that are being filed. One as recently as November 11th. Um, October 10th, there was lawsuits, but essentially they all are around violating either California Invasion of Privacy Acts or wiretapping for a wiretapping acts because of the fact that it has access to all private emails, attachments without consent, exposes finances, health records. You got HIPAA stuff in there, politics, political leanings of people, all kinds of data you can get from email. And the biggest problem is that Google flipped the switch without warning anybody. Like news is getting out now, but only very small channels compared to really how big this is. Remember that our uh, prior generations were smart enough to include in the laws that you couldn't read somebody's mail coming into their mailbox without it being a federal crime. I mean, if I go to my neighbor and I pull their mail out of their mailbox and start reading it, can be charged with a federal crime for that. But we have these companies who are able to read your emails, which now contain more information than your mailbox. Not a lot of people get regular mail in their mailbox. Everything's electronic now. And yet these companies have no rules to what they're able to do with it. And Google has flipped on the switch to be able to read all this stuff with very little warning, if any at all. And they buried opt-out options uh, in their settings, which I'll show you. It's very difficult to actually figure out where these would be. You think you'd go into your account and then go to data and security or the privacy section. Nope, not there. That's not where you turn it off. So there's always some little gotcha that, that Google tries to employ where they, you've got so many settings now if you're in the Android and Google sphere. Good luck finding them all. And then if there's an update, they'll probably turn them all back down on again. So in this video, we'll briefly touch on ways that you can turn them off. Uh, but what I really want to focus on is kind of exposing this for what it is. I'd love to get your opinions on how you feel about this. But 1.8 billion plus users have AI turned on in their boxes. Because back in the day when Google came out with Gmail, it was probably one of the most exciting product launches. I'm old enough to remember it. It came out. It was invite only. It was the first time that an email service had this counter on it that just kept ticking up the amount of space that you were going to give you. Every other service had this real arbitrary limit on the amount of space, but Google it just kept going up and up and up and up. And this counter was live for months, if I recall correctly, maybe even longer than just months. Maybe it went on for a year or more. But every time when you got that special invite, because your friend could invite a friend that could invite a friend, kind of making it go viral, a little Facebook-like action there. You were excited to get an invite to get into Gmail. And that caused so many people to sign up for this service. And of course, they were playing the long game on us. And well, looks like it's working out for them so far. But really what you need to do is find alternatives. That's what we're going to talk about. We'll get a little bit into what Google's actually doing, and then we're going to look at the alternatives. All right, so what are these services and are they really worth losing your privacy over? I mean, that's the big question you should be asking. And reality is you should never sacrifice your privacy for anything. But a lot of people do. Convenience stacks above privacy. And my evaluation of studying this field for a long time, 
interviewing lots of experts on Destination Linux podcast and just in my personal life, people who've written books on the subject who were pen testers like Bo Weaver and other things. Uh, my evaluation is that people will always choose convenience over privacy and they'll choose security over both of those. So if you tell them like, hey, we want to go protect the kids, we don't do anything else to protect the kids. And we got all this other stuff going on that, you know, sure looks suspicious going on in the government with kids, but uh, we really need access to all your private files and then we could protect the kids. That's, that's kind of the, the general lip service that we get, right? Um, so Google turned on meeting notes and live translation and meet AI listens to every call. They have Gemini deep research, which pulls private emails plus files without any extra, uh, clicks. And then of course this enabled by default across apps, granting it continuous access to your full history. Every email attachment chat for analysis storage is one of the reasons why they are facing a lawsuit. Now, Google promises we don't train on workspace data, but your content is still processed by Gemini in real time. And again, remember, all of these settings to train are on default to on for 1.8 plus billion users. And opt out is very much buried. So these features are meant to essentially help you to be able to translate a meeting live. This is a very useful feature, especially with those who have different abilities. Uh, additionally, they allow you to be able to reply easier because it has a full history of your email. It could potentially know that you have dinner reservations for a restaurant. And when you're replying to that person, it automatically will post in there the dinner reservations. So you don't have to go look for it. It saves you some time, not a lot of time, let's be honest, but it saves you some time. Most of us have gotten used to having two tabs open or being able to open an email and copy the stuff from one to the other, but it saves you some time without a doubt. And that for some people is enough just to see the coolness of that itself. That's the same reason people put things like Alexa's in their home, despite the fact that they're not utilizing local data to process that they're always listening. They're recording your conversations with your spouse, all your intimate thoughts and details that you have behind the shut doors of your home doesn't matter. It's really convenient to say, hey, Alexa, play some music. Uh, does it save you really that much time? But again, that convenience factor is there. So how do you disable these services? Because a lot of us have, including myself, Gmail accounts. I have multiple Gmail accounts. Like I said, I was one of the first ones there. Now, intelligently, and I highly, highly recommend you do the same, I have moved my most personal stuff and things that I, you know, health records, banking stuff to ProtonMail or Tuda. And so you don't have to worry about that nonsense over there. Now, Gmail has become my catch-all for spam and crap things that I've signed up for over the years that anytime I delete or unsubscribe mysteriously, I have some random need to find it, like cords and cables. The same excuse I use for keeping every cord and cable I find. Uh, so I still have them. Um, so how you disable these is you have to turn off Gemini and Gmail in your personal accounts. You open Gmail, you got to hit the settings gear, and then you got to go to see all settings. And there you'll be able to look for smart features and personalization. And you can uncheck all three boxes, a smart compose, smart reply, email summarization and nudges. And you can do the chat and meet tab and turn off Gemini and Gmail if that's there. And then you can disable Gemini apps in the side panel for your workspace account. Cause yes, if you have a separate workspace account, if you pay for that, you have to turn that off as well. And it is a separate settings for that. So if you have workspace enabled, you're going to need to turn those off. Uh, you can also try to block all of these different Gemini services and things by using something like uBlock origin and blocking gemini.google.com or ai.google.dev and that may help you with some custom filters and things uh, there to help block. But really, just turn off those settings. Now, there's nothing saying that when they do an update, they're not gonna just turn them back on instantly. So just remember that you're gonna have to stay on top of this, and if you change it for one of your Google accounts, it does not apply to the others. You have to go into each Google account, click on that settings, and do those same steps there. Now you're safe now because you've turned those things off, right? 
Mm, not really. See, it's still not truly private. Google still scans for spam, and which, you know, listen, none of us want spam. So we get why they do some of that. Uh, ads and free accounts and safety, they will scan things for those categories. Uh, Gemini, of course, as we mentioned, can re-enable itself after updates. There's many reports of people stating that that's happened. Um, even if it's off, past scans post October 10th may have already exposed your data. So, uh, lawsuits out there claim that Gemini exploits history for tracking, violating consent laws uh, for CIPA and other things out there. So just know that there is no winning with Google. If enough people go and turn this off, which you all need to, don't sleep on it, then they're going to try to find another way to work around it. And then I'll have to make another video of how you get around that, which we will do. We will keep fighting the good fight. As long as you're there watching, as long as I have one person at least watching, I'm going to help that one person get this stuff off. And the number one way I can help that one person is sign up for a free Proton Mail or Tuda account. That's your real fix. You know, these are very privacy focused email clients. If you have the resources, you can pay and get extra space, but you don't have to do it. I think you'll find that as you transition over to those services, you're going to be amazed at how good they are. This isn't one of those things where it's like you're going backwards to go into Proton or Tuda. You're actually going forward in an email technology. And they also have free VPN for Proton VPN. Uh, also has a free service. I don't think you get to select the servers and things, but it's a cool option that's there. And if you have the resources, you can, again, pay for more space uh, as needed and things in there. Or just create really good habits with your email to be able to stay on top of them by not signing up for everything in the first place. And so... You know, I hope these lawsuits do end up being successful in the fact that I don't know that these fines ever really hurt these companies enough to matter. But if these lawsuits could at least expose this issue, maybe embarrass these companies and maybe even create some legislation to help, you know, protect end users from these type of violations, especially this opt-in by default thing, or we're already been training, now we're going to give you the option later type of stuff. This is where it would help. And of course, if the fines were actually big enough that, you know, they, they're making $10 billion off your data and the fines like 150 million, the biggest fine ever is what most of these lawsuits are. And it's like, they win. That's a great profit margin. Why not keep doing this crap? Um, I'm at an interesting crossroads. And I'd love to get you all's thoughts on this, where you might be at. AI is useful. I find many, many uses for AI in my life. And it, and it does help generate ideas, um, put new ideas onto or expand upon ideas that you have already put out. It can certainly help with some code and finding errors and things like that. Again, with caution. Uh, there's some good things about AI, but I'm not quite sure we've gotten our, I don't know, what is it, trillion dollars that's been spent on AI, whatever that number is worth yet. Uh, but I think it's going to continue to get better. It, it kind of has to with the amount of money that's being thrown at it. Uh, at the same time, very concerned about what this does for privacy and security. In fact, AI is the number one reason why I chose cybersecurity uh, to go back into that field because I realized that the privacy violations, the security violations that this is going to create are going to be spectacular on a scale that we've never seen before. That's my opinion. I'd love to get yours. Please leave your comments below. Thank you for all the love and support. I hope you have a wonderful holiday, whatever you celebrate in November. Uh, please enjoy it, get some time off, spend some time with friends, family, online or real life. However you do it, it doesn't matter. Love your faces. And until next time, get out there and fill your brains.